All right, so the talk that I chose uh, for this Grand Rounds is to talk primarily about patient engagement. And I struggled uh, for a little while with the title of the talk. Uh, we uh, Initially, I talked about bridging the gap uh, to kind of try to describe what it is that I do being a vascular surgeon who is also working in the space of genetics, uh, but also this engagement work. Uh, and in the end, we settled on beyond the once in a, once in a uh, career diagnosis. And, and this will become clear as we go through the talk. Um, I don't have any, uh, you know, conflicts of interest. These are my disclosures. Uh, my research is funded by PCORI. I also have grad funding through the Airless Download Society, uh, and uh, I serve on the PCORI Rare Disease Advisory Panel, as well as the Marfan Foundation and the Airless Download Society. So over the next hour, what I would like you to walk away is learning about engaging patients in research, uh, what is engagement, the what, why, and how, you know, how do we engage people, why should we engage people, and ultimately, what is the measure of success, and I'll share the lessons learned that are weaved in through uh, the uh, experience of engagement that I will share with you, and what I would hope is that you walk away understanding that patient engagement is crucial for contemporary research, and, uh, and this is truly the new way uh, of doing research. And um, as you mentioned, uh, I'm a vascular surgeon, so my particular interest started with an interest in aortic dissections. Uh, and I was reflecting back at my last grand rounds here, and this was in 2015, when I talked about personalized care and the quest for personalized care in aortic dissections. And over time, my research evolved into focusing on people with heritable aortic disease or young people with genetically triggered aortopathies. And what became clear is that this is a heterogeneous population. There's uh, multiple options for care without really strong evidence in the long-term or outcomes at the individual level. And uh, even when we have long-term studies, the detailed uh, granularity that one would wish to have is not present. And now uh, for the trainees, it's sort of helpful to always, uh, you know, people ask, well, how did you get started? And so this is how I got started on this path where Vascular airless stainless syndrome is one of the syndromes that is associated with aortic dissections. And so we focused on that uh, as a brand new faculty and wrote a couple of papers along the way. But really what that taught me is that because this is a disease that is rare, there was much lacking in the literature in terms of truly coupling the genotype phenotype correlations or looking at the imaging when you're thinking about the disease process itself. And additionally, there's this element of ascertainment bias where people with the severe forms of the disease come to attention. And as a consequence, it became clear that you, you really need to know um, a comprehensive uh, under, or have a comprehensive understanding of the natural history if you are gonna move the needle. But also what was missing is patient input into research priorities. And so that's how I got into the engagement area specifically. And so what is patient engagement? The best definition I have seen is that these are researchers doing research with patients, meaning they're equitable research partners, rather than for or on them, i.e. they are research subjects or cases. Uh, so this is truly the theme of engagement that, again, you are working with equitable research partners. And there are things that you have to do in order to ensure that this kind of relationship is truly equitable. And the benefit of this is that People, patients who live their own healthcare experience and interaction with the healthcare system, have a, they have an expert voice on this topic. And it allows us then to participate with them with by understanding their experience, we can work with them in a meaningful and active collaborative way to improve the research process, uh, process itself. Patients who are living with this disease have enhanced knowledge uh, into the knowledge gaps, have insight into this. Uh, they have better understanding of, uh, you know, by, by engaging them, you'll have a better understanding of what the patient's priorities are. And then additionally, uh, your quality of your research design will improve and ultimately you will have better patient uh, participant and enrollment into the study and will decrease the attrition rate. And one of the things uh, that one of the patients said to us during our work is that it helps researchers choose the medications for the trial that better aligns with something that we are willing to take. So we can pick whatever agents we think are necessary, are reasonable to use, but ultimately you really need to go to the end user and ask them specifically if this is something they're willing to do. Additionally, there's a growing demand for patient engagements and research from funding agencies. You're seeing this more and more. And so a little history on this, this is driven by PCORI in the United States. It started in 2010, 
Uh, it was uh, established by the Patient Protective and Affordable uh, Health Care Act. And the goal of this funding agency was to fund comparative clinical effectiveness research. Uh, and that is research that engages patients and other stakeholders throughout the research process. But not only is this here, but you can see it also in Canada. They have the Canadian Institutes of Health Research started SPORE, the strategy for patient-oriented research. So this is a very sister uh, agency to what PCORI has done. And if you look in the UK in 1996, they established uh, this INVOLVE group, which is the National Institutes for Health Research National Advisory Group, uh, in order to support public involvement in the National Health Service, public health, and social research. So here's the why. When you think about traditional research models, these tend to be, again, researcher-centric. So these are the research you know, on or about uh, cases and subjects. Uh, usually, it, it involves controlled environments that may limit generalize, generalizability. So when you look at classic uh, efficacy or a randomized trial, you're looking at uh, ideal circumstances in which the, the interventions are steady, but that may not reflect what happens uh, on a day-to-day -day basis in the community. Uh, additionally, uh, there's this quoted time to translation that of 12 years from the time of finding the results of the study to the time of implementation into uh, our clinical practice. And then lastly, as I mentioned earlier, the challenges in patient enrollment. So the engagement process itself then, what it does differently is that it's going to give you research that is patient-centered, useful, trustworthy, and ultimately it's a greater use of uptake of research results by the patients and the broader healthcare community. And, and it's trustworthy is a key element to this whole research, and this will come up in a theme, but building trust with, with the community of patients. Obviously, it leads to, um, from my perspective, for rare diseases, this is necessary because of all the challenges that I mentioned related to, for example, what you saw in vascular illness syndrome as a uh, example of a rare disease, but this applies to other rare diseases as well. And certainly if you're thinking about a clinical trial and you want to enroll people, uh, it's an imperative to involve patients up front. So what does it look like? Well, if you think about it, engagement really is a continuum. Uh, it starts with simple informing. So you're telling the community your plan, um, and, and this is a, a research announcement, for example. So that is a simple uh, preliminary engagement uh, process. And then it can build on. You can have consultations. So you can have advisory boards in which you're consulting them on decisions, uh, and they give opinions and advice, but they're not true partnerships. And then you move up to the next higher level, which is collaboration. So this is where you decide together, you act together, you make joint decisions and joint actions. And then ultimately the highest form of engagement is stakeholder directed. So this is where you see independent initiatives that are uh, driven by the stakeholders and they generate the research itself. And in fact, if you look at the way PCORI funds research, it will take applications from community uh, initiatives uh, in order to fund this type of, of uh, patient-centered research. And as I mentioned, you know, patients can be engaged with researchers and should be engaged with researchers throughout the research process. So that includes uh, from governance to priority settings to research conducts and dissemination of results, and then evaluating uh, the results and the effectiveness of these results in the community. So some examples could be applying as a joint grant. Uh, so where are their co-applicants? So for example, in the vascular illness downless syndrome, when we first applied for our engagement award, uh, we applied uh, in the conjunction with uh, two brothers, John and Dave DeMassey, uh, as well as us. And so, uh, you know, one of them was a physician and one of them is in business, uh, but they had a, you know, they were big stakeholders and were interested in this process. And so they were our community partners. And then, um, so that's one thing you can do. Other things along the way is providing input into the surveys. If you're generating surveys that are uh, patient facing, uh, patient information sheets, I'll show you some examples, and then other research materials. They can also help you recruit participants to the studies. Uh, or if you're performing interviews, they can participate in that as well. Uh, when you analyze your data, you want to present your data analysis to the community and help, they will help bring an insight to the interpretation of the results of whatever data you have. And ultimately, they can also help you identify novel opportunities to share research findings. So what you find along the way may surprise you and it may not be something that you thought about, but because of their shared experience and their lived experience, they can give you that insight. And if you were to look at the principles 
uh, of engagement. These are what PCORI calls uh, the engagement rubric, and I put the link here to the PDF, and it's, it's worth a read. And basically it focuses on four things, reciprocal relationships, partnerships, transparency, honesty, and trust, and co-learning. And the other thing that PCORI acknowledges is that every engagement journey is different by disease process or by population. And so as people uh, delve into this field, they can develop new materials that are relevant to their population. And there's this constant co-learning, not just from the group that we're engaging with, but from other groups who are doing this type of work. The other component I want to talk about is again, trust. I think it's very important that you say what you'll do, do what you say and follow through. So investing in relationships to build that trust is really essential to success of these efforts. And here's how I see these patient researcher partnerships. Uh, they are a tri-legged stool. Uh, so step one, you know, you're going to build this infrastructure necessary so that researchers can work uh, with patients in uh, sustainable partnerships uh, that will inform the research work. Uh, connection, the cooperation, and this is where you're connecting, uh, you know, groups, uh, cooperate, creating cooperative opportunities between patients and advocacy organizations and researchers. But the idea is that you're creating these opportunities so that advocacy organizations also are empowered to advance the research efforts that are in line with uh, the patient priorities. And also you wanna build capacity. So this is where you're connecting stakeholders with the researchers and with the resources and education necessary so you can build capacity. And what that means is that you're empowering them to be equitable and meaningful research partners. And again, I'll cover that uh, a little further. So this is our methodology for how we approached uh, the, uh, the engagement work. And I'll start with their four elements, relationships, infrastructure, knowledge, and capacity. So all of these serve the mission of these patient researcher partnerships. And so if you were to look at the first one, uh, which is relationships, this is the ultimate product of this is that you're creating this large community that is focused on research prioritization and design. And these type of relationships are synergistic and can lead to outcomes that are beyond what you had intended when you started the engagement work. And so it, but it's essential to actually propelling the research in whatever area you're involved in. So how do you go about finding stakeholders? Well, here are some tried and true methods. You have the method of convenience. So this is a patient you see in clinic. So again, going back to collaborators, not cases, you know, when you are talking to patients, you're thinking of them not only as collaborators on their own health care decisions, uh, but there are people who are genuinely interested in research. Um, and don't know how to get involved and are interested in getting involved. And so by engaging them and giving them the tools that they need to be um, active participants, you can tap into a population of people that want to make the world a better place. Um, you can advertise in clinical departments. I've not tried this particular one. I mean, we, uh, you know, we talk to people, we talk to colleagues, um, but it's about networking. It's about spreading the word that you're working on this space and then it brings people together. Um, again, part of this networking is asking about other people who might be interested. This is an important element here, which is connecting with local uh, or national patient support groups or advisory groups. And so you want to search, you know, the landscape and understand who's doing what and what are the efforts that are happening. And you can look at the social media. Social media has revolutionized um, this type of work. And I would say, you know, historically speaking, if you look at the engagement, the field of engagement is relatively young, uh, but it has piggybacked heavily on the evolution of social media. So here are examples of our early social media or outreach to online communities to understand who's out there and to identify different groups. Uh, this is Katie Wright. Uh, she is a friend of mine and uh, we had met as a method of convenience in clinic where I mentioned this work in the early phases. Uh, and then it turned out that uh, Katie was doing all kinds of advocacy work. Uh, and so she joined us in our second grant as a uh, advisor, patient advisor. Here is an example of the size of the potential audience. So if you were to look at vascular ehlers Danlos syndrome compared to aortic dissection, the field is much smaller because the disease is rare. So if you look at publications, there's about 1,000 publications on PubMed for vascular EDS versus almost over 30,000 publications if you just type in aortic dissection. And so 
but in that space of rare disease, which we estimate there's about 7,000 patients in the United States, you can see the potential audiences by these different groups, whether it's using Facebook or Twitter uh, or even Reddit, where you're trying to outreach to people. And so there's definitely advantages to using social media in terms of finding the research partners. Um, it allows you a quick dissemination of information. And again, you're tapping into already formed social support groups that are in existence. The disadvantage is that not everybody is on social media, and certainly the population that you're able to reach through social media is not representative of potentially the larger population. And this is one of these ongoing discussions that we're currently having in the Aortic Dissection Collaborative is how do we reach a truly diverse and representative uh, group of people who would be uh, interested in being our stakeholders. Another component in relationship building is the virtual meeting spaces. So we had used Zoom uh, as our platform and uh, the meetings were every other week and we uh, alternated our advisory and stakeholder meetings uh, and you know, generated the agenda ahead of time with the tasks and the items that we wanted to achieve in these meetings. The advantage is that, is that it is efficient and cost effective, so it allows you to have frequent meetings uh, and it evens out hierarchy. Certainly these, uh, social, these virtual meeting spaces, in, uh, in our opinion, seems to facilitate flattening the hierarchical structure so people are much more comfortable uh, in speaking up versus uh, when you have people in the same room. So the dynamics shifts a little bit when it's into a virtual medium. And then also recordings can be made available to people who have missed the meeting. So that way you're reaching um, a larger group of people who may not have been able to dedicate the time. And certainly COVID now, as you are familiar, for example, today, we're meeting on Zoom. So COVID accelerated the use of the Zoom meetings uh, and it was definitely a boom uh, for that. So here's our early, early uh, engagement work. And you can see that when we scoured the landscape, you can see that there are multiple organizations uh, that are uh, working uh, towards patient advocacy. And then there was the different people in the community doing this kind of work. Uh, and at the time, you can see, for example, the evolution even of the, Mar the Marfan Foundation used to be the National Marfan Foundation, became the Marfan Foundation, and now it's the Marfan Foundation related disorders, including vascular EDS. So there's this constant growth within the community. But what we were able to do is, again, bring everybody for the first time uh, ever under one virtual table, if you're at one virtual table, uh, to engage them. And, and these are all communities that are just have a stake in research. And so we were able to work in unison towards a unified cause. So what about the how? Like, how do you start operationalizing this vision? Um, so that's by, uh, this is the infrastructure building component of this work. Uh, so you want to start by forming a governance structure and creating a mission and a vision statement. And uh, you start creating this virtual research network. And what that looks like in practice is that we um, had different tiers based on time commitment uh, into this engagement work. Uh, you have the advisory group. So this is the core group of people that uh, practically put in the application. Uh, they're responsible for the strategic planning, uh, preparing funding applications, uh, leading manuscript developments and meeting presentations, uh, and then dissemination of surveys and progress reports and analysis of the results of the surveys. That is the core nucleus group, but then you start expanding to now you include a stakeholder group. Uh, so this is again a diverse group of people. So for example, you can see here in the aortic dissection collaborative, we're looking at not only patients, but adding leaders in research, patient advocacy groups, uh, industry. And the idea is that this group of people will contribute meaningfully to major decisions and give you feedback again on your materials and outreach plans uh, that you are developing. And then you have the virtual research network. This is the community of people, patients and family members and clinicians who don't have time necessarily to invest or a whole lot of time to invest into the engagement work, but they're available on an ad hoc basis. Um, as you send out surveys, people may put in uh, their information to say, I would love to hear more about research priorities or I'd love to help in, in some way. And so then you can leverage this virtual research network uh, as you move along in your process. This is that mandatory busy slide that everybody has to have. But the point of the slide is to show you that we had to craft our mission and our vision statement. So for example, for the vascular Ehlers-Danlos uh, Syndrome Collaborative, we 
crafted a vision that we wanted to support the vets community to drive the patient-centered scientific research to improve the management of vets and increase the quality of life for all those who are impacted by disease. And it's really important to have that mission and vision uh, statement because as things grow and evolve and relationships, uh, relationships shift and change and morph, you want to always go back to saying, what was our true mission by doing this work together? The knowledge component, what that means is that you want to get a better sense of uh, the pre-existing patient-centered outcomes and comparative effectiveness research knowledge and willingness to participate in research. And I would also suggest that part of that knowledge phase is also understanding what people's frustrations are, what they think the gaps in research are, and what it is that they think is important, and, and are they willing to participate in research. So here is an example of how we did that. Uh, this was our first survey, and we sent this out in early 2018. And it was a short survey, it was 28 questions. And what we wanted to ask is about four domains, the diagnostic and clinical care history, experience related to vascular EDS, information seeking behavior, and willingness to partner with researchers. And so we received 300 responses. And you can see, for example, this is one component of asking about what's frustrating about people's diagnosis. Um, and you can see that not having cure uh, available was a frustration as well as physicians not understanding the disease because it is a rare disease. And so when people go to see somebody, they may be the only person that this physician has ever seen who has vascular EDS uh, and concerned about that there's not enough research in this space. And then you have the normal things that you would expect, emotional well-being, decision-making, financial strains or relationship strains. We also asked people specifically to rank what was the most important goal of research. And you can see that the most common thing or the number one thing was discovering effective treatments, but close after that, you also have educating care providers was important to the community. And when we asked people if they were willing to share their medical records for future research studies, 93% said, yes, they are willing to make this happen. So this leads me now to capacity. So you, you've said hello, you've met the community, you've, you've identified people who can be uh, the stakeholders and participants, but really now you want to reach um, a stage in which everybody is on equitable footing. And so this is that researcher, non-researcher partnership development, and you want to build that capacity. And what that means is that you have to give them the knowledge and the tools and the skill sets so that we are all speaking a shared language as we move forward. So here uh, is an example of in year two, we did this education series in which based on the topics that were identified and the frustrations that were identified, we uh, put together a program to say, here are the tools that we need so we can move forward in this space. And so we had a diverse group of speakers, for example, John Gorey from uh, UW here talked to us about actual patient engagement work because he was more uh, further ahead uh, in what he was doing as well as trials, particularly CISTO, uh, the randomized trial. Uh, and Danielle Lavalli was doing a lot of work as well in terms of this patient, adv uh, patient advisory networks and so on. So they talked about that component of research. Uh, but we also had Haldis and Diana Milowitz talk about animal models. And we had uh, Ron Lacro, for example, talk about the pediatric trials. There was a randomized trial uh, looking at medications and Marfan syndrome. Uh, and then we had people from PCORI come and talk about how PCORI funds trials. And so as we, this is that co-learning experience. So we're learning together about all the research that is in this space and the tools that we need in order to design the best trial uh, to reflect the patient-centered uh, priorities. So this led us uh, to uh, July 27, 2018, which is our first in-person meeting. So now we moved, we had budgeted for one in-person meeting. And uh, the themes for that meeting were divided by, again, the topics that have come up, which were quality of life, uh, finding a home and creating a care team, holistic approach to management of beds in pediatrics and adults, and then pregnancy and vascular EDS. These are topics, again, that were uh, you know, driven by the community. And this helped us refine the research questions uh, as during that time of meeting. And we also made that meeting available to the virtual uh, research network where people can, uh, again, using the virtual space capabilities, uh, log in and listen in and participate remotely. And subsequent to this, we refined the questions and then we gave back the community those questions and said, here are the, the 12 research questions uh, that have come up from this work help us prioritize them, let's rank them. And you can see we had responses from patients, caregivers, and clinicians. And um, 
this matrix kind of shows you where things ranked uh, or in the top five for people. Uh, so barriers to care uh, was number one for both patients and family members. And that was nowhere on the top five for clinicians and researchers. So I guess, like I mentioned earlier, what you learn may surprise you uh, that this was an important issue for them. Uh, the second topic was, you know, do beta blockers or medications uh, have, uh, you know, fewer adverse events? So, I mean, do they make a difference in terms of treatment? Quality of life was important. Exercise was important. And the question about surveillance and the surveillance matter because of this idea that perhaps it doesn't matter if you're not going to operate. Uh, so those are the, the research priorities. And so we took those and then divided our uh, groups into different working groups that worked on developing these fact sheets. So they each took a topic, which are these five topics, and did a literature search and an understanding of like, what is the current state, where are the gaps, and what potential trial designs uh, would be beneficial to answer some of these questions. And that led us to this conference award, which is the second year of our work. And so, again, it was a bunch of uh, virtual type meetings, but then we had an in-person meeting in Nashville in, 20, in late 2019, and where we talked about these uh, particular topics. So here's what a deliverable looks like for the contract for uh, PCORI, is that the engagement work will identify the key topics uh, that are amenable to pragmatic uh, trials, comparative effectiveness research. And it also gives you research prioritization so that you can take these topics and convert them ultimately into patient-centered uh, um, applications uh, for people. Uh, sorry, the slides are jumping. So this is what our timeline looked like over time. So you can see we started in October 2017 and here we are three years later. And uh, at, subsequent to that meeting, we had a survey that we asked people about uh, their willingness to randomize into a medication trial. And uh, last month, we just submitted the Meds for Beds proposal uh, that was designed exactly based on uh, these meetings. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. So what we walked away now from two years of engagement work with the, is a list of action items that offer an opportunity for researchers to say, uh, to justify why they're choosing particular topics uh, in this space, because these have been ranked highly by patients and uh, by all this work that we have done, and also have a background about the knowledge gaps. And so, for example, if you look at uh, vascular EDS treatment, there's a lot of discussion about vascular EDS treatment, surveillance, and pregnancy, and these all lend themselves to a retrospective natural history, retrospective studies, as well as natural history, longitudinal observational studies. And subsequently, we launched the uh, Vascular EDS Research Collaborative Study, and the name uh, was also named by the community itself. And not only did they help us name the study, but they also helped us design the consent protocol, uh, the community participation, uh, meaning saying that instead of relying on different centers, enrolling the patients and having the burden placed on the participating centers, we would simplify it by having a central location, which is the University of Washington, where patients can enroll directly. And then the, we can reach out to their physicians and uh, obtain their records. But the patients can also help us collect their records because many people have binders about their condition. The, the community's voice also is very important in encouraging us to not only enroll patients, but also enroll loved ones uh, who had died, uh, and as well as children. Uh, children have traditionally been excluded from research because it's just easier to exclude and there's a lot of regulatory burden to involving children. And it certainly took us about a year to be able to get through the IRB and to get approval to enroll children, but now we can enroll any ages so the parents can enroll the children and there's some regulation around that as well. Um, the community also gave us uh, feedback on the study flyers and helped disseminate it, and they still do. The other component that was very important is at the time, they, uh, you know, we wanted to reduce the burden on the patients. So one of the things that came up quickly is that sending papers or faxing papers for them to sign consents uh, was just burdensome and, and not an easy way for people to do it. So we wanted to have an easy button. And as a such, we explored the idea of using DocuSign so people can get their uh, consent forms and email, they can look at them, they can sign them and send them back. Certainly mortgages work that way, so why can't research work that way? Uh, and that virtual en enrollment, um, you know, what was great about it is A, it made it easier for patients, and B, 
when COVID um, happened and a lot of studies sort of halted because of the lack of in-person uh, enrollment, we were still able to continue enrollment uh, business as usual uh, because of this virtual type of enrollment that was already in place. So here is, again, going back to that meeting in Nashville uh, and talking about the Meds for Beds trial, you can see that we spent the bulk of that meeting specifically on this because it was one of the harder trials to design and we really needed input from everybody. And so you can see that we use the PICO format, which is an evidence-based uh, medicine type format, talking about the population treatment and outcome. And then we divided uh, the groups uh, into three groups and we made sure that they were diverse and balanced between between the different levels of expertise uh, within these groups so that they can work together uh, on answering some of these components uh, of, of this trial. And so we started with, uh, you know, having quote unquote the experts, meaning uh, people who are doing the research in the animal models and genetics uh, and who understand as well as, you know, just from a clinical perspective, we, we laid the foundation for the knowledge base that we had, as well as people presented from within their groups that worked on fact sheets, what they found, and then divided into these groups. And then subsequently we sent the willingness to randomize survey and then continue to work again virtually uh, on this letter uh, of intent that we submitted last month. So more to come on that and we'll see uh, if we had made progress in that space. And as I mentioned earlier, the benefit of this is that you go beyond just what you as, a, as an investigator or as a, as a lead investigator that, you know, not one person can do all the work. And so the benefit of this engagement work is this, this synergy and establishing that risk, list of priorities then can, can drive future efforts beyond the original team. And I'm highlighting a couple of things here. So for example, uh, the barriers to vascular EDS care is still a very, um, uh, topic that is very timely and important to the community. And you can see that the VEDS movement now has created the CME uh, module for emergency phys room physicians to spend an hour and learn about vascular EDS and how to recognize it if they were to encounter these patients in their uh, ER. Uh, as well as the exercise in vascular EDS, uh, you know, Siddharth Prakash is a car adult cardiologist at uh, UT Health who is doing work in that space. And then also uh, Shane Morris is a pediatric cardiologist who's also doing some work. She's at Texas Children's Hospital. So again, this gives uh, other researchers the opportunities uh, to, 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 again, lend the research in those, in those areas as well. So that leads me to the aortic dissection collaborator. So this is the newer uh, or the more recently funded effort. And uh, basically our goal was to engage patients with or at risk for aortic dissections. And you can see that we started again in a very similar model with the patient advisory group. And we have, uh, you know, I'll shout out for Sarah Lawrence, Jenny Lee, uh, and uh, Peter Byers, who are my collaborator on this, and more recently Sarah Cook, uh, who had joined us. And uh, one of the things that happened is that this particular work started before COVID. And as a consequence, it came to a halt when COVID happened. But what was interesting, uh, sorry about the jumpy slides. What was interesting is that while we had a community survey running, COVID happened and we were able to get additional funding to actually study the impact of COVID on the community. And those surveys just closed, so we'll, we're starting to delve into that data. But what we had learned now is that there are new challenges with this new group engagement because the issues, uh, maybe while there may be similarities to the community of vascular EDS, uh, this is a much larger and more heterogeneous population. Um, and we have had a tremendous response to the survey via and creating, beginning to create this virtual research network. But what we learned very quickly is that people don't think about their disease in anatomy. And what I mean by that is when we submitted the original grant application, we specifically focus on people with type B aortic dissection, uh, and only to realize in the early surveys that people don't think of their dissection anatomically, they just think of whether or not they've had a dissection. And so when we applied for additional funding, we uh, also, you know, began to expand the scope to say, well, I mean, patient people don't think of their disease as whatever anatomic label we gave them, and, and we need to think in a broader perspective. 
The other challenge that I thought was interesting and we've been thinking about a lot now is that over 200 people were interested in participating in a qualitative research arm. This was for semi-structured interviews. And of course, we don't have the, the uh, bandwidth, of course, to interview 200 people, nor is it necessarily 100% necessary. However, you want to in engage those people in a more meaningful way than just beyond being in the virtual research network. Uh, so now I'm kind of melding over this idea of short, we're exploring this idea of short-term engagement options, maybe for a few um, hours of their time, um, but this is something that's still evolving. And then obviously the biggest challenge is not being able to have an in-person meeting. In fact, we were supposed to have an in-person meeting this month and that did not happen uh, as a consequence of COVID. And so we have to think about new approaches again to how to solidify these relationships. So a hybrid model works, I think, best in terms of forming relationships. And that includes the virtual uh, working spaces as well as the in-person meetings. But now we're in a new era in which meeting in person is not necessarily practical. So we have to kind of think about that. The other evolution is that while in our earlier work in vascular EDS, uh, we involved patients, patient advocacy groups, and family members, uh, this one we're expanding our definition of research stakeholders or our inclusion of stakeholders to include clinicians, uh, researchers, research consortia, and uh, ultimately we want to also add physician organizations, insurance carriers, and industry. Uh, industry has been a very interesting space because uh, when you have the meetings with industry, industry is thinking, well, what money do you want or what are you looking for specifically? And, and the reality is what you're looking for is participation in this engagement work. So here are the lessons learned. Uh, I think the most important thing is to involve patient advocacy organizations early. These are community, these are, these are forces within the community that have gained trust over time. And so you want to reach out to them and get them involved early and, and leverage a lot of their networks already in existence. Uh, you want to use social media and online searches to identify patient-led initiatives. There are many patient-led initiatives that are outside patient advocacy groups. And so you want to connect with those people as well. And then just realize that it is an iterative process. So every iteration, every time that goes by, you're increasing the diversity and the numbers of participants um, who are involved in this work. And it does take time. It truly does. It, it's, it's not a ready-made type in uh, community, but you're building it over time. And again, the ultimate goal is not only just the engagement work, but you want to be able to give something to the advocacy organizations to support the engagement of patients at an organizational and policy level. And uh, the other thing the, uh, to learn from this is that recognize that the patients are really part of social groups, families, communities, <clears throat> and that these broader networks can be a positive force for change. Uh, so that synergistic relationship that is happening between you and the patients and the community can grow and we learn together. So here are some examples for it uh, that happened along the way. So during this time, so during our second year, Acer Therapeutics, for example, was a company that was interested in bringing uh, a non-FDA approved drug to market, uh, specifically for vascular EDS. And they outreached to a lot of the patients who were already involved in the stakeholder group. Uh, so that was one, you know, synergistic thing that we saw happen. And then in terms of sustainability, and, and you can see the evolution of, of the movement is this generation of the VEDS movement, which is sponsored by the Marfan Foundation. And it's actually under the leadership of Katie Wright that I mentioned earlier, who is our uh, early, one of our early patient advisors. And so she's leading this movement to help address a lot of the gaps that we had talked about that are uh, deemed necessary by uh, the community. Another example, uh, and this is more of a smaller example, uh, uh, we were working on a book chapter project uh, about vascular EDS, just a review chapter, but we reached out to the community and asked for pictures and it was an overwhelming support from the community where they were willing uh, to share pictures so that they can go into these chapters to update, uh, you know, the, the knowledge that is out there for people. Again, it's part of this dissemination and educating physicians. And so as I come to a close, it is uh, worth reflecting on this idea uh, that development and validation of partnership models to engage patients in the design and governance of clinical research programs is still in its infancy. Uh, it's hard to remember this, but I have to remind myself that this is relatively a newer child or a newer way of research. Uh, so I hope that you have learned about what the what, why, and how um, of patient engagement. 
And I do want to give a shout out to this amazing group of people that we have here at the University of Washington. So if any of the residents or medical students who are listening, we also have other uh, physicians and other specialties who are doing this research, uh, namely Farhud Farja, Dave Flum, uh, Danielle Lavalli, John Gore, Erica Wolf, and Kimi Dahl are all working on different aspects of engagements within their specialties. And so it's worth, uh, again, spending some time and looking at research, the, what they are working on as well. Um, and, you know, this is, I, I want to say, you know, take a minute of a word of gratitude to say that I truly am indebted and filled with gratitude to my collaborators, generosity, and patience uh, for taking this journey with me. Um, and I'm really humbled uh, by my patient collaborators for their courage, grace, and passion every day uh, as they uh, go through their own lived experience. And as you can see, it does take a, vill a village. Uh, so I appreciate your time and uh, I look forward to our discussion. Dr. Shalhoub, thank you for a fantastic talk this morning. Um, again, always so timely uh, in, the, in the topics uh, and things that you're presenting. Uh, I want to open it up for a few minutes if anyone would like to ask uh, a question themselves over Zoom, and then after that, I will moderate via chat. Shireen, this is Dave Flum. I just want to congratulate you for a great talk. Thank you for reviewing that. Um, all, it's phenomenal how much to see how much work it takes to put together a trial that's really patient informed and it is cutting fresh tracks. That's actually sort of my question for you. I, I want to know how much you think we know about patient informed research and whether or not it really does impact recruitment, retention, um, and, and maybe dissemination, or is that still in its aspirational space? Again, great talk and super review, and you've had a wonderful path here of, of really trying to keep true to the patients we take care of, and I, I really respect this, so congratulations on your work. Thank you, and, and I think it is fresh tracks. I agree with that statement, because even as I was putting this talk together, I was spending some time just doing a literature search on trying to understand, you know, what is out there? What have people put out there? And there's some really good uh, resources where people have shared their own experiences and engagement, but I haven't seen formal assessment to say that, for example, it has increased recruitment into trials. I can say anecdotally, uh, when we started the natural history study, uh, we, within months, you know, we started this in July, um, 2019 and to date we have 212 pages that are enrolled and have sent us their records uh, which is tremendous and I don't think that could have been possible without patient engagement uh, and just relying on just the traditional ways of doing it but as we all grow in this space I hope we are also assessing um, how this impacts the the you know the retention and dissemination of materials um, I know Picori is following this as well and so it's worth you know for people who are just hearing about this worth spending some time uh, on the Picori website and seeing again they, they will update that. They also have a national meeting that's annually and so that has you know again it's been worthwhile uh, for me to just go and just kind of attend and hear what other people are doing. We have a question from Larry Kessler. Hi Shereen, I agree with David. Great journey and great talk. I want to talk ask you about a question uh, something you mentioned early on bias. One of the things I worry about in patient engagement is the patients that we get to be very engaged, they might have uh, more bandwidth to do these things, they may have uh, flexibility in their life, higher socioeconomic status, better communication, better ability on Zoom. How do we make sure that we're getting representative populations when we go out to reach these groups? Because I think that's going to be a challenge for us in almost any of our engagement activities. Larry, thank you. I, and that's exactly what one of the recent topics that we've been talking a lot about in the aortic dissection collaboratives. How do we make sure we have true representation across the board? Um, I was listening to some work that was done uh, in the primary care uh, arena where they were engaging patients as well. And uh, what they had noted, because they were, they were asking people about their um, not their socioeconomic status, but about their educational level. And what they found is that, again, there's a bias toward higher, more educated uh, people being involved in that. Um, and, and I think that is our next challenge, right, is how do we reach other people to genuinely have a diverse group? One of the things we did in our recent survey is we took the data from the survey and like I said, over 200 people said they're willing to talk to us in the qualitative component. So we try to the extent possible to pick people 
from a, from diverse backgrounds, diverse ethnic backgrounds, diverse locations in the United, in the country, uh, to, and different ages and genders, in order to to have representation as much as possible for at least from that cohort of people that said they're willing to participate. Uh, but I think one of the, the challenges is going to be in the dissemination component, like not only disseminating the results of studies, but disseminating the results of engagements and letting people know that this is something available. I would say I thought it was interesting that the UK has this population based approach. Uh, of where they're reaching out to the population. Um, so I think that would maybe another thing that PCORI could consider at some point. Um, another group of people in their, this is in Canada, they sent to their community in their city uh, this lottery type system where they say, congratulations, you're one of the 10,000 people in our community who have been selected to help us understand more about how we manage uh, clinic appointments in primary care. And so it's, and then would you be interested in participating? And I think out of those 10,000 people, they got 300 responses. So there are definitely challenges, but there's now novel and creative ways to approach that. And I think we should all continue pushing that. Thank you. Dr. Wright. I, I know that um, you now have patients coming to see you from all over the country um, because of your work in this area. So I'm, I'm curious if you found that your work in patient engagement and research has affected the way that you work with your patients clinically. Absolutely, it has. Absolutely. It, it's, it's, all, it, it's all one thing. It's all holistic for me. Um, it, it changes the way you have a conversation with people about their disease process. Um, there's insight that comes from the engagement work that you can bring to patients. Maybe they're not engaged, but they're coming to you with a particular issue. And then you can speak now with some at least ref reflect back to them that what they're experiencing as is not they're not alone in what they're experiencing that there are other people who are like that and then you can connect them with the community so now there are these this sort of like again sort of this relationships where you can say not for research but if you're interested there's this particular group of people who you may find yourself to be compatible with so let me make introductions um, so i think that helps a lot there's a question in chat from Dr. Reyes saying, uh, what are the regulatory and compliance burdens to patients and how do they navigate this level of engagement? Um, I'm presuming, um, Dr. Reyes, you, you're talking about IRB approvals and, and if that's not it, I'll answer, I'll talk about the IRB component, but if that's not it, please chime in. Uh, one of the things in terms of the outreach, uh, we did go to the IRB and say we are making these surveys and we're going to outreach to the communities. And what's interesting is that because the surveys are anonymous, uh, then they are not, you know, they, the IRB approval for them is fairly straightforward. So they review the survey questions and then, you know, you just, you get approval for that. Um, but one of the things in terms of, you know, there are identifiers from the standpoint of asking at the end by saying, do you want to be contacted for future uh, updates on what we're doing or would you be willing to participate in an additional survey? And so people can put in their name um, and, their, and their contact information, but we make it very clear by saying that this will not be linked to the answers uh, specifically for this question. Um, so, th so that, you know, that we do separate that to, again, allow it to be anonymous. I think if we wanted to have uh, something that is more identifiable, we'll still have to go through IRB and get the approvals, not unlike what we had done with the natural history study. Um, but honestly, I thought the IRB uh, was very reasonable. It takes time to propose these ideas, but they were very helpful and supportive and thinking of ways with us to make this happen. But did that answer your question, Dr. Reyes? Shireen, uh, yes, to partly... Uh um, I have a bad connection because I'm out of the country, but the, uh, I'm really impressed with this methodology for research. So I congratulate you for, and happy that you introduced this to me. Um, the, my question is more from the standpoint of, of training and compliance for research. If they are true participants, then uh, don't they have to have uh, compliance modules that they need to check off? Uh, in order to be a participant in the research, uh, as far as the the team, not necessarily the subject, and uh, and it, since you're making a lot of these consent forms and stuff easy, uh, is their compliance made easier as well from the from the standpoint of their training for research? 
So, right, so that's a great question. So for example, when we are presenting data, let's say we have the survey data and we're presenting this to the group, that's presented in a de-identified manner. And so there's not, they're not looking at charts, for example, where you need to do HIPAA training to look at a chart. So that's not part of that experience. Um, but the other component is, is we, you know, we have not done a formal necessarily training on compliance burning or HIPAA, but we have done the, the training from the standpoint of talking uh, to the community about what IRB looks for and what needs to go in the form. So like when we developed these consent forms, the community was involved in that. And even though there was back and forth with the IRB, we went back to the community and said, here's the back and forth with the IRB. How do you suggest we approach this? Uh, so from that perspective, they're gaining experiential knowledge into the logistics of what we deal with on our end from an institutional experience. Um, and, and I think there's definitely room to keep evolving and, and training people more you know, in that perspective. Fantastic. I'll leave it open if anyone wants to uh, have any further questions via direct Zoom or by chat. Uh, but while I pause for that again, uh, Dr. Shalhoub, thank you for a fantastic presentation. Um, I think really highlighting some not necessarily new ways, but just the advancement that has been made by you and your group uh, in doing this is just fantastic. Thank you. I will say if any of the trainees are interested, we have plenty of work to do. So we, we'd welcome people who are interested. All right, I think we will uh, complete our meeting and I'll just again make an announcement. Do recall that there is a separate Zoom link uh, for the faculty for the resident review. Uh, and so we'll see you all there shortly. Have a great day. Bye-bye.